Welcome to LD Disrupt, the podcast dedicated to helping you overcome workplace challenges and prepare for the future of work today. I'm your host, Nelson Sivlingham, and I'll be speaking with the movers, shakers, and path breakers in LD who are reshaping their organizations right now. Join us each week as we delve into the highs and lows of work in the industry to get to the real nitty gritty stuff that you actually care about. Welcome back to another episode of L&D Disrupt Live. As I said, I'm sure there's a few new faces here. So just to let you know a little bit about us and the show, uh, my name is Gary Stringer. I'm the Content Marketing Manager at How Now. I'm also joined by our CEO, Nelson Sibberlingham, who is also the author of Learning at Speed. And every couple of weeks, we speak to innovators, forward thinkers, people with new ideas and new perspectives about L&D, people development, HR, and, and sort of all the things that orbit those issues and um we love to take your questions live so if at any point during the show something sparks kind of a, a fire or a question in you then drop it in the chat and we'll try and get to it uh but today i'm pleased to say we've got a great guest uh in the form of richard ward who's the co-founder of assemble you um assemble you create podcast style courses and resources for learning so obviously given the title of today's episode richard is more or less the perfect guest to join us and talk about these things so uh welcome to the show richard Great to be here, guys. Nice to meet you all. Likewise. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll kind of come to the backstory of Assemble You, how you got started and who you are as we progress through some of these questions. So we can probably get into the sort of main talking point of or the thing that kind of kicked it off, but whether or not audio content is underserved in the in the world of corporate learning. So there's a great stat, actually, that I learned from your blog that 74% of people use podcasts for learning. And yeah, from like a lot of people's experience, we don't come across audio content a lot of time in L and D. So, is that underserved? Do you think? Yeah, massively. Um, and it's a bit of a puzzle as well, which is partly why we've um, chosen to go into this space as a as a as a business. Um, we we're also realizing there's a lack of research out there. So we just did a survey ourselves and found the 86 plus percent of people or professionals don't have access to audio from their L&D department currently, but 92% of them would like to and see it as an effective medium to learn. So there's there's some sort of early stats there. And then we've worked with other um, large uh, aggregators of content out there, and, and the percentage difference is kind of staggering. It's 90 i think it's something like 98 percent of content on some, some of those platforms is screen based or video based so so it's just uh massive it feels like a massive miss and hopefully we can get into that a bit today yeah definitely i guess it's do you think it's maybe dem- like supply hasn't caught up to demand or maybe the research wasn't there that encouraged people to invest the time and, and money and creating audio content or can you see any sort of early reasons of why it's been happening yeah i think um so audio has kind of been categorized solely with podcasts which is entertaining somewhat more casual or informal modality in that um sense so maybe it's just um been seen as as kind of not the the done thing for that traditional e-learning um producer but uh when you start to look at the potential or actually when you look at the popularity in the consumer market of audio it's it's mind-blowing the figures of what people you know the trends that what people are doing then you've got kind of we're projected to have over half a billion um podcast listeners by in the next couple of years that we're kind of on trend for those sorts of figures so that you can't really ignore that the demand and the popularity is there and then you look at maybe bbc and what they've done with um sounds uh, how they're investing in audio there i uh what is it spotify have spent over a billion in acquisitions so so in the consumer space it's massive and it it's just feels like it's a matter of time until this moves into the l d market yeah, de- definitely agree with that, Richard. Because if you think podcasts have been around for, for years, right? And when first podcast came out, it was very niche. It was a very much a small yeah. early doctor community. And then there was like a renaissance for podcasts again, right? They, they, they all of a sudden 
uh, got popular after being under the radar for many, many years. And like, if you look at the macro trends around it, it was the accessibility, right? We had, um, you know, headphones with microphones and we're now glued to, you work, walk around co-working spaces, people have got their headphones permanently glued to their ears. You know, you're either on a call or you're listening to something. Um, and now that we're working you know, remotely hybrid, we're constantly either on, you know, virtual calls or audio calls, et cetera. And, and I think the accessibility of, of headphones. And then also, I think the multiple interfaces, um, you know, it's not just um, headphones. There are home speakers and smart speakers that become uh, a part of it. So I think the, the number of devices through which you can listen, I think what we're starting to see a shift towards is there's more opportunity for listening time than there is for reading and watching time, right? Where When I'm at the gym or when I'm uh, on commuting in a packed uh, wash hour tube, and, you know, when I'm cleaning the house, there, there are more opportunities for listening time than there are for reading and watching time. And I think that's really what's driving this shift. And, and really this change, like Richard said, is happening quite fast, right? From the moment podcast picked up now, now we're seeing a rapid kind of growth in, in listeners. We're seeing more content being produced for the audio format. Um, and, and I think also people creating content are now creating content and making it available in multiple formats, right? I think um, you, know, you take something like the Joe Rogan podcast, which is available and gets a significant share of um, watchers on YouTube, but also its fair share of listeners directly on, on Spotify. And I think content creators are now ready making their content available in multiple formats, which, which again, increases the supply that's available for, for content. Something. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, I was, I was sorry about that. It's definitely coming into the kind of video space, um, which pulls it full circle, doesn't it? So you, you've got the, um, what is it, Rich Rolls podcasts, um, high performance podcasts, you you find them very high production level on YouTube, black backgrounds, quality microphones, all of that. So the popularity is, is evident and the content's there. And now people are starting to produce videos off the back of it, which is is fascinating twist to see in it. Yeah, I think I heard someone saying a little while ago that actually YouTube's best uh, feature is not to be something for distribution but discoverability and people in the podcast space are then taking clips and things like that and using YouTube to be discovered as opposed to necessarily a, a platform for distribution but something Nelson mentioned there was discoverability and I guess that is one of the things that makes podcasts and audio content such uh, a useful tool for learning we can access it at different times it's the ease of there's no friction really between us getting a podcast on and, and getting to learn some things find some value but when you were kind of starting out um with assemble you and i guess you were doing more research into what makes a podcast so useful for learning did you find anything interesting then yeah definitely um so so that that flexibility was kind of front of mind for us and how it can fit into the flow of your day so like like we just said say your your commute etc um we did a survey recently that showed um the the most popular time to consume audio is actually whilst resting um so not and then i think second was commuting or traveling and and things so you can start to see how it gives you this um freedom um to consume content you're not kind of locked to your screen and we look we also researched elements around burnout and how high that is on the world health organization's agenda and what's driving that and screen fatigue is one of those elements that's in there so this all sort of helped us formulate um why we felt the the popularity of audio in the consumer space needs to come into the the corporate space um and then uh, another um bit of really interesting research out there is by spotify and it talks about Gen Z and the popularity in consuming audio there, audio there. and the reasons cited are around um, the privacy and intimacy of the experience. So um, if we take this into the um, B2B space, then we're, we're starting to look at a, a lot of um, diversity and inclusion content. So let's call it sensitive topics. Um, 
And if you're there in an office um, and you've got your screen and it's about microaggressions or it's about bullying or it's even about pronouns or something that, that maybe you don't want other people to see that you need to upskill yourself on or um, wish to, then the the privacy of, of just walking through the office or wherever it is with just your headphones on gives, gives that real... Um, privacy and ability to consume that content in a, in a different way so a and, and i think yeah j- just building on that richard like i really could relate to that kind of feeling of oh, my lights turned off but <laughs> let me quickly t- turn that back on um the idea of kind of intimate and feeling like you're being there i think a great example of that is for those of you who are familiar with gimlet media who was acquired by um spotify but one of their kind of original shows was called, I think it's called The Startup, which was basically just kind of capturing their growth as a startup. But they would record in meetings they went to, so live meetings with customers, investors, um, intimate conversations internally when they were thinking about running out of money. But you felt like you were there experiencing those conversations and, and really learning about what the journey of building a startup was in such an intimate way where yeah, it almost kind of absorbing what was going on. I thought the fact that you could create that at a fraction of the cost of what a video production would have been to, to kind of recreate that same intimate feeling was was quite incredible. Yeah, it's a yeah, great example. Yeah, there's kind of two things there actually that, that are interesting. One is that intimacy thing because there's a lot of topics that people don't want to discuss in the workplace that they need help with. So I read some good research lately. Uh, I think fifty more than 50% of people are kind of having an issue with their financial situation and how it influences how they act at work but at the same time they're also not particularly comfortable having that conversation at work so this is maybe a great place where lnd can uh, lnd teams can act as a, the real facilitator of the bridge between things people aren't comfortable with and content they need to to kind of help them through it and i guess the other thing is actually authenticity is comes back to what you mentioned there nelson and this is something i've often thought about audio content from a marketing perspective that when we write content, we try and lean into sounding smart. And then when we speak out loud, and especially coming full circle to what we said at the start, if we have to listen to ourselves back, we will try and speak more like our audience. We won't be overly formal, overly pompous. We won't try and use words that are, you know, like unnecessary. We'll speak in the terms of our audience. So yeah, just a curious, Richard, to get your take and, and then Nelson's as well about authenticity and whether that's something audio content helps us do. Yeah, it's huge. And um the way we produce a lot of our courses is it's um, got a professional voiceover and a, a well-researched written script that they they read to. So we sit somewhere between e-learning and podcasts. And, and one of the key briefs that we give the voiceover artists and we test them on is conversational tone. So if if they come over to stiff or rigid in in the way that they're delivering that material, then it's a it's going to be a turn off. And we we got some early feedback on that when we were testing. Um, I think that's absolutely critical because if if we're going to tap into the popularity of podcasts while still delivering an educational course, then you you've got there's a, there's a layer of kind of almost conflict in there in how how you do it so it's not a discussion it's not a you want to take out the ums the ahs we we need to be concise get to the point um is is the goal of what we've been producing but uh yeah you you're very much looking at how do you get that sounding as as natural and authentic as possible so so it's somewhat in that entertainment space still so it's a, it's a balancing act that one for sure yeah, I think a great example of that kind of conversational and authentic tone is, is actually audiobooks. I, I In the early days when I tried out audiobooks, I really couldn't engage. I, I was a big reader, but I struggled to get into um, audiobooks. And then I was recommended um, listening to, I can't remember the name, but Obama's uh, book, which is which is essentially read by Obama. Um, and the difference it makes to you know to same words but in in a very authentic conversational tone that I almost felt like I was at a fireside chat where it's just me and Obama um and 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 it created a whole another experience and so I think that authentic feeling again I think the audiobooks are uh, incredibly successful um and and really grown in popularity but I also think as a side note 
audiobooks are still in their very early days because we're not creating content that's native to that format. We're essentially just reading the words on the page. But I think there's so much more we can do with audiobooks that are native to that format. Right? There's no reason why you can't do create an experience that you would only be able to have in an audiobook that you couldn't get um, if you were reading the, the book. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. And I think that's the, the opportunity we we have now, whether it's creating content or uh, you know people like Richard at Assemble U creating learning content in an audio format. I think we're at the early place where there's so much we can do natively that's true to that format that you couldn't really do fit it within any other digital format. The um, the fireside chat comment really stood out for me there because uh, we, we keep getting asked to deliver that for people. So we, we do bespoke work for our clients. And one of the most popular requests is to pro- help them produce a podcast series with their executives, which is ultimately a fireside chat. So it, this is where l d is starting to work alongside internal comms. And you're starting to work with onboarding teams, et cetera. So um, we've got one example where the CMO is talking about creativity for 30 minutes. And it's a bit cliche, but the CFO is talking about productivity and results. And so all of the staff get access to these people in in a very digestible way. Um, And that connection with internal comms seems to be growing at the moment. We, we've definitely seen this done really well with um, our customers at How Now, and I think it's something we recommend having seen it done really well, which is to create almost the equivalent of how we have Netflix or Spotify originals, but it's to have your own organization's or, uh, originals that are only available on your learning platform, right? which is essentially a great way to launch and, and get people to come there because you've got exclusive content that I can now only find in this particular place. And that exclusive content is things like that, right? Fireside chat or, um, you know, a recording of a, of a live meeting or a, original authentic content. Um, and I think audio is a great place to start. Often, you know, we work with L&D teams who struggle with video because it's quite expensive and, um, you know, it requires maybe more of a team. Um, whereas I think to get to a relatively higher production value with audio is, is more achievable with less people and less resources within an organization. And you can be creative with, with the format and the tools that you have. But yeah, I think it's definitely exciting for when you see organizations create their own audio content and, and you see the reaction to it. Richard, funnily enough, something you and I spoke about before was internal podcasts. And actually, when I was posting about this episode before, that was one of the things that got the most traction. So I guess maybe that's a good segue to come on to that. When do you think in addition to the stuff Nelson just said there, but when else do we think like internal podcasts could be most useful? Um, sometimes it's good for culture. I remember you mentioned to me before, it's about access to people you might not ne- ne- uh, necessarily have access to every day. Yeah, so the, there's definitely the the culture piece. I know it's come up a few times in discussions around mergers, acquisitions as well. So how you help sort of connect um, two different businesses together how you communicate clearly um and then and then there's also the element of maybe a couple of key executives or or members of staff that are experts in certain topics just don't have the capacity to get around the global organization so you've just got the natural um reach benefits of it as well um those seem to be the ones that are coming to mind for now yeah no i agree i think it's um it comes back to something we've spoken about before, Nelson, but it's rather than people continually repeating the same content, we can apply the same thing to audio content. So your CEO doesn't won't always have time to speak to every new batch of employees that joins and have the same intensity and the same energy. But if they could do it once and make it repeatable, then that would be helpful as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, for, for sure. And I think there's so many parts of what we're already doing where you know right now the default stance within organizations might be to go towards an, your kind of traditional e-learning course or to do a classroom or virtual classroom session but i think there's an opportunity here to review those touch points and see where actually you've got more tools in your toolkit and audio is one of those and looking at where would audio be a better format to deliver deliver this message. And I think 
it goes back to something we've spoken about a lot in the show of being outcome focused. It's, it's what is the right tool for delivering that outcome rather than often what happens is we start with a solution we already have, right? We, we start with, we've, we've got this virtual class that we're running every week or every month, or we've got this e-learning um, course that we bought that we need to use. And I think rather than starting from that point, you start from, okay, what's the best way to, to deliver this, right? Um, and it doesn't all have to, again, you know, be free with the format. They could be short bite-sized snippets. They could be more long-form content, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think going back to where we started with the kind of underserved, um, definitely audio creation and audio as, as a kind of format for learners um, is, is definitely being kind of overlooked. Yeah, if anyone on this call or anyone listening in the future is thinking about starting um, a podcast, a couple of tips that are just really basic things. So, so firstly, I'd say think about whether it's a discussion or a delivery of material. So um, a delivery of material is probably a single voice, a bit more structured, slightly more formal. A discussion has two, three, four people, um, and probably to your point earlier, Nelson is a bit more long form, so thirty minutes to sixty minutes. Um, so, so those those are some some tactics. Um, highly recommend a microphone or a laptop with a really well built in microphone, just for the audio quality for people. Because you, you're going to, if you start to have multiple people on the call, then you can get variation. And then if if you've got an in house team that are, are building um, e learning courses for you, they they'll effortlessly adjust to sort of the editorial process of of an audio course so it's uh quite you know you haven't got the complexity layers of a video so so it's um going to be quite easy for them to get some software in and and tidy that course up so hopefully that helps yeah absolutely i think funny enough it's something nelson and i spoke about fairly recently ago again it was um a good it's kind of the idea of a good plan today is better than a perfect plan in a few months. And there are things you can do today that are really low friction to create your own audio content. So, I mean, we're using Zoom today. Zoom downloads a separate audio file. Um, there's free tools out there or tools you can try for free, like Descript, where you could mm -hmm. upload an audio file. And I don't know if anyone's seen it, but basically it creates a transcript. And then to delete things like arms and R's and irrelevant points, you can just delete them from the text and it deletes them from the video and audio file. So that allows, allows you to kind of edit it down to that succinct stuff in real time. So there's lots of little things people can do, I think, um, to get started. And then it's like what we spoke about before, Nelson, like test it out. Does audio content work with the free stuff you have available before you go and sync like hundreds and hundreds of pounds into the equipment, I guess? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I think it, it... Oh, go on, Richard. Sorry. I was just going to um, touch on Descript. I'm pretty sure they do audiograms. Is that right? Where you just got the text kind of rolling on the screen. It's a really nice way of bringing a simple cost-effective video element to it. Yeah, definitely. And I think it goes back to the idea of this kind of rushing towards hiring out a full-on recording studio and making yeah. sure things are polished and perfect even before you've tested it out. And, and you don't have to. Right. Is there's there's a minimum level of quality threshold that you need to hit. Beyond that, it just gets better. But people are willing to accept that minimum level of, of quality threshold that you need to hit. And which, like you said, Gary, you can achieve that with with things you can buy. Like I think, you know, they're great microphones. I think even under like 60, 70 pounds, you can get a great microphone. Um, most people are probably using powerful headphones because consumer headphone quality has now got to a level where you're getting great quality anyway. Um, and then there are these great tools that you can trial out for free. Um, and so really the, the kind of cost to get started and to deliver something of a minimum quality um, that is acceptable for the learner where they're getting that value um, is really achievable. And, and it doesn't need massive amounts of planning you don't need weeks and months to get it just test it out right test it out with a small target audience what do you think it still goes back to the core fundamentals you know what is going to be relevant to them what problem is this solving for them how do you know this is going to say it still goes back to the core fundamental but you can create something and test it out maybe later on down the line if you get feedback where people say actually would have been great if this part of the audio was available as a video or there was yeah. something to support it because I would have loved to see that. Then, then great. 
right? Then you you can use that feedback now to invest in creating videos and um, you know other supporting materials where necessary. And you, rather than starting by creating that stuff and realizing it was redundant in the first place. Yeah, completely. Um, we're coming up to sort of the halfway point now, so I'd be really keen to hear anyone's thoughts in the chat. Um, have you used internal podcasts or some audio content internally? Have any experiences to share with everyone else? That would be really cool to hear. I guess to change tact slightly, a lot of what we've spoken about so far is about creating new content. Um, and I think there's a big place, especially from what I see, people are trying to leverage existing podcasts to share with their team. And I think a pitfall I see a lot of the time is... They assume that because a podcast is a more engaging format, if they just share a whole podcast with people, then they'll find it engaging and find value. But uh, it's comparative to sending a 100-page PDF that's got two pages that are relevant to you. If a podcast is an hour or more, and there's only two or five minutes or so that's relevant to you, then you're still looking for a bit of a needle in a haystack. It's just in a more engaging format. So, um, yeah, something I wanted to pick both your brains about was how do we kind of add more context around the existing audio content that's out there how do we share it in a more useful way to our audience maybe we'll start with you richard and then we'll and then we'll bring in nelson yeah so in in our early research we found the popularity of audio was added evident um you take a book it's eight hours you take a podcast it's one um and then you look at the corporate learning space and engagement seems to be the the one of the massive challenges around content that's provided so let's offer the corporate learner um a new modality audio which we know is popular but in a more concise format so some people call them mini pods they're sort of 10 15 minutes long um and with that you haven't really got time for introductions like we we didn't do today which i totally get um and you haven't really got you you want to strip everything out as much as possible. Um, so, so we went down that route and then we found that we crammed too much in. So in that 10 minutes, it was like uh, overwhelming amounts of information coming at the listener. And if you're on a commute, you haven't got time to write it all down. So, so there, there's like this sort of tethering process in, in that, in, in that sense that you've got to keep it sort of nice, consistent story structure to, to what you're producing. Um, maybe give people three, key facts not possibly five but you know that those kind of elements just to make sure that it's concise factual um and also actionable at the end but um th those are some of the things principles we we work towards but without overwhelming them um or rushing them because you don't want to create that sort of anxiety off the back of the course yeah definitely and yeah so yeah, I was just going to say to you, Nelson, it comes back to a little bit about your curating a mixtape example you gave us before, but we can apply that to um, what we said here to maybe boil down an existing podcast episode into the format that Richard just explained to us, can't we, by bookending it with sort of relevant stuff. Yeah, I mean, you could actually create a learning mixtape here with, with the audio format and you know bring together your greatest hits of, of kind of knowledge <laughs> nuggets that you think are relevant. And I think that's again you can you can start to really take bits from podcasts or audio books that you think are relevant and like we just spoke about the tools and the friction is quite low for you to be able to put together um almost a, a, a not a playlist but kind of curating together all of these different nuggets that are based around a similar theme right so you can really uh, bring those together but i definitely agree with kind of richard's thought around mini pods um, and often I love listening to mini pods that are available where they focused around one or two fundamental ideas. And because most people don't have a problem with listening to a lot of audio files, but I do think there is a, a challenge with having too much in too short content, um, which I have this problem where you know, every time you listen to something, you want a moment to reflect back and you want to kind of write your own piece around it. And I find myself sometimes listening to a podcast that's so dense that you're stopping every 20 seconds because you're like, wow, I need to really think about this and how it applies and contextualize it. Um, and that can be, you know, until we start to get more mainstream tech that allows you to um, essentially do the equivalent of a highlight and annotation that we do with, with text, um, until we get more mainstream tech that allows you to do that with audio format. 
I think it's probably best to use the format in a way where you are more focused around what you're conveying. Uh, and I think mini pods is a, is a great way of doing that. Do you know that there was this study you've just reminded me of, Nelson, um, by the University of Michigan, and they, they were looking primarily at the retention of knowledge. So comparing reading to listening. Um, so they they found that those that read retained more information, but it was um, more surface level, lighter level content. And those that listened retained less, but they retained the key points. And so it's it's kind of one of those interesting studies out there. And I'm fascinated to sort of keep looking for more of this because if you if you can work through the or your lights have gone off again that's great uh we've, we're boring the light engineer over there um but yeah so if you can if you can work through how can audio help you get those more reflective deeper learning moments if that's possible then then that's a really interesting spin for how how audio can help a blended learning program bringing that variety in there yeah I wonder if some of that comes back to, in, like Nelson said, about the current tech we have available. So at the moment, I know Nelson is a voracious note taker as well, but if I hear something good on a podcast, I'll write it down. And then the fact that I have to manually kind of highlight and annotate it actually means I retain more. Whereas maybe actually when we do have the tech that just lets us do it frictionlessly, we might find ourselves in the same problem actually and we're retaining less. So uh, keep your notebooks. Yeah, it, it always it, it kind of reminds me, Gary, of like, um, I'd love to know how many people go back to their Kindle highlights. Like, I, I'm probably notorious uh, for that, although my preference is to read physical books. When I have read it on the Kindle, you go, you have a highlighting frenzy, right? You're like, oh, especially when, you, when you're reading a great book and, uh, again, really going into that. And I think, but I'm a big fan of highlights and annotations, hence the reason why even within How Now, you can highlight and annotate any of the learning you do within the platform. Um, because sometimes if you've got a I don't know, an hour long course or a 10 lesson course, you only want to revisit those kind of 10 core ideas that really connected and meant something to you. And often within your kind of traditional um, learning systems, you don't really have an easy way to go back to the just the bits that I found really relevant and meaningful to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely think the highlights and annotations. I'll be interested to see where technology goes in this audio space. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, coming back to this point around how we use existing content and how we can use the tools we already have available a bit better. Some of them are actually catching up in a way. So Spotify recently added this share from timestamp feature. So if you go to share an episode with someone and you're listening at a certain point, uh, there's a little toggle at the bottom and you can tick that now and share it from uh, the point in the podcast where you're listening. Um Similar to what we said about the script with the audiograms, there's Headliner, which will let you create five under 10 minute videos every month in that wave format. But what's helpful about that is it doesn't have to be your podcast. You can go and find any podcast from the internet, search it, timestamp it, and then export some audiograms that you can share with other people. Um, obviously, we spoke about YouTube earlier. That has a lot of podcast content on it now. Um, and you can create clips really easily on YouTube, again, just from the two timestamps. Uh, start and finish point next to the little share button there's the ellipsis click that you can create a clip um whatever length you want it to be and then you can share a link directly with people so hope i think there's some signs that the tech actually is catching up a bit in ways that help us take the fluff out of what we're listening to and just say this one part will help you because i was speaking to someone recently who's having this problem they're sharing podcast episodes with their team but they're not necessarily getting any traction and so my advice was to try and remove the friction by saying this is the part that's going to be useful to you. And I think that's kind of the mindset to get in in the meantime while the, the tech kind of catches up. Um, I guess to paint an honest and fair picture, it'd be great to maybe look at some of the challenges around audio content as well. So um, I guess one of them would be where don't you think they work particularly well? Or maybe you've seen, Richard, that there's, there's situations where an audio piece of content doesn't work that well and we might need to, you know, be more selective yeah so it's around topics um for us so we we focus on power skills um formally in our world um soft skills and it works it lends itself really nicely there um i think um coding programming um digital skills training 
possibly not so much um you know imagine an excel course through audio that's going to be really hard to um stay stay on track with um where it surprised us a little bit we we were able to do some project management courses recently talking about agile scrum um prince to the the different methodologies um we've done them as introduction courses so it's for the broader knowledge worker to understand those principles if we were to go deep into those topics um we haven't looked at that fully but i think we might come unstuck a little bit there because i think screen-based um learning absolutely has its place um we're not looking to replace it by any stretch it's um it's really to to complement it and and bring bring more variety into that experience so um those are the ones that come to mind mostly and then um away from topics uh it's probably the um the voice itself there's so much emphasis if there's no screen to kind of imagine an animation you the voice is irritating but the animation's entertaining so you stay with it um you you just have to really um over index on on your your recruitment or your selection of a, a voice in that way yeah no, I totally agree. Um, Nelson, are you seeing some of that when you're seeing how companies are perhaps using audio? Yeah, I, I think what Richard said there in terms of it's probably true for every format, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just audio. I don't think there's a single format that's probably right for every type of uh, learning or challenge that we're trying to solve. And I think audio in the same way, it did probably certain types of learning or topics and skills where it's it's probably better suited for. Um, and the tech is still early, I think, like we discussed um, before, but I think that will start to change, see change and, and we are seeing it change. Um, so I don't actually have too many kind of drawbacks on audio. I'm, I'm actually a big advocate for it. Um, and yeah, even one of the things we've not really touched on, you know, like we talk about this a lot in the show around it's important you can deliver learning when it's relevant and it's no good if you kind of take six months to create something and actually the moment of need is passed. Um, and so the faster you can meet that need, um, the more impact you can have and, and become more relevant to the learner. And I think any content type that reduces the time for you to be able to meet the learner when they need it um, is great. And I think audio does that because there are, there's a lower requirement and there's less friction to be able to create audio content and get it out there. Um, it means you can meet the needers, uh, that the learner's need is quicker, right? And it, and it cuts that time to meet and become relevant. Um, it might not be every need, but the need it can meet, you can meet them faster. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for, for going audio um, and actually creating audio first learning content, right? We've discussed a lot around um, taking other things and converting it into audio, et cetera. But I think audio first in itself opens up a lot of options that some of the other formats might not. Yeah, one of the uh, other options we that's probably another discussion in itself is, is translation um, and how how it lends itself pretty well to that. But if you if you look into the translation industry at the moment, there's a lot of AI automation capabilities there. So Google Translate is a, a sort of popular one that's well known. Um, and so then you you get robotic voices and all, the, all of that capability as well. If you put that into a kind of podcast style course or a podcast in itself, I think the listener will have little forgiveness for that it, it is our hunch. So when we've done some translation work, we we very much human translation, human voiceover, localized language, local references, et cetera, which is more complex. But I, I, I just think you've got to be careful in the audio space that there, there's no... There's there's nothing else to paper over any any errors or areas of um, areas that you might have missed. So you you can't distract the uh, the learner in another way. So um, probably just want to to keep in mind if there's global companies on this call looking at how do we take this series and localize it, then human translation, human voiceover is is our tip there as well. Yeah. No, exactly. It reminds me, actually, that I used to work in a digital marketing agency, and um, one of the problems they often have was context when translating paid ads. So I think they were charged with, uh, I think it was a paid ad campaign around World Cup tickets, and they were just translating directly the 
content into different languages and certain countries that were just getting no conversions right and it, it it just needed that sense check from someone as well to say actually i mean literally the translation is okay but we wouldn't say that it's kind of this this is actually the terminology you want to use and they saw like a massive increase in sales after that so i guess it is that maybe they had in that context again like go back and listen to it and think does this translated content kind of still capture the context i guess and, um, and just yeah so it's just going to add to and another type of with kind of content that we're talking about and is is not just kind of the learning material as such but even for example feedback right um it right now where you might just be um capturing written feedback that you're sharing uh with learners and, and vice versa again i mean you know we do voice notes um and it's users consumers to communicate with each other but it's not a format that's uh, hugely used to capture, um, you know, it's hard to recognize tone sometimes. In, and we see this when we're messaging uh, internally. It's hard to sometimes read someone's tone uh, and the context and the nuances of what they're trying to say. Whereas, you know, a recording of providing that feedback captures um, a lot more of the nuance that might be missed in, in kind of written text. So I think it's not just around courses and podcasts but it's using the audio format for the entire learning experience and feedback is a critical part of that learning experience that we could also use audio for yeah and uh, nelson coming back to the audio first thing you mentioned we've got a great audience question uh, unfortunately i don't know your first name p mcmullen um <laughs> tell us your phil. name <laughs> it's phil uh, gary hey nice to meet you um yeah i guess my question just really just linking to what you're saying um nelson was I guess if someone's got a piece of written content or something that they're trying to study, having that audio first, which as you were talking about feedback, could be a great way of getting you into a learning mindset. And I just wondered if audio first really helps you focus better um, because you're listening to something and listening to someone is, it requires focus and attention. And if you're studying, I just wondered if, bookending some content with audio first, especially if it's self-led study content, having someone talk you through or just set things up, how that would help you get into a learning mindset more effectively. Um, uh, and, and yeah, that, that was just really my question really is, do, do we think that that helps learning mindset um, when we use audio first? Um, do you want to take that first? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sorry. I. Um, there's an example we have where we're working with a digital coaching business. And so where they're leveraging our 10 minute audio courses is as a preparation to, to a session or a follow-up to a session. So for that coaching, so there's, um, I'm definitely sensing that people like the idea of it complementing a broader program. Uh, if that if that helps um it's not the sort of silver bullet single fit very much yeah no, that makes sense yeah I agreed i think it like you said the format almost demands a certain level of attention that sometimes where you're reading on your phone or your laptop with notifications and other distractions and easily losing that uh focus whereas with audio has that ability especially great audio content you know if you ever been lost in a podcast you can completely forget you're on a busy tube um and so that ability to kind of get you to focus and going back to some of the things we mentioned earlier around that intimate feeling you feel like you're there especially when it's one of those kind of conversations and um yeah definitely i think to, to kind of get you hooked right and then to kind of build on that by leveraging other formats yeah i think i think yeah it's a great great idea of using it in that way I think coming back to that bookending point as well, actually, the the intro in particular is a great way to set expectations and explain to people the value they're going to get. So thinking from a marketing standpoint, it's so crucial in that first 30 seconds. Well, to be honest with you, it's six seconds, but and it's probably getting shorter. But if you can bookend it with something that says, this is what you're going to get out of doing this, you can expect to learn this. It's going to help you go and do this thing outside of the learning. I think that is possibly the most useful. And um, yeah, I'll connect on, on LinkedIn afterwards. I've got a few examples of great podcasts that do that, that really, I have that it's the, the host explaining what they're going to get, or there's some great podcasts now that is just chopping up like 10 second, five second, four second, like little sound bites that really lure you in and explain 
without somebody even telling you, like you get the snippets that show you there's going to be value. So um, yeah, it'd be great to connect after and I'll, I'll send over some examples. Um, yeah, I guess another thing thinking about what we spoke about a lot so far is tech and like what the future of audio in L and D is. So I don't know. I mean, I mentioned it to Nelson the other day, Richard, but I don't know if you saw this thing called podcast.ai this week created a completely fictional conversation between Joe Rogan and Steve Jobs just by scraping the internet. And uh, I think essentially what they did was the AI was trained to use Steve Jobs' biography and every recording they could find of him online. And they did a similar thing with Joe Rogan, but they created a completely false conversation about a few topics. So, um, yeah, just curious to get your thoughts on that, actually. Uh, that's first I've heard of that one. So I'm like fascinated to go and research that. But um, wow. Yeah, just really smart tech, I, I suppose, is is the main thing there. And then it's um, going to come down to that authentic content and how real it can it can be in in that experience um one one small thing we we've been brainstorming a new kind of product concept and could we take snippets and quotes say uh, from obama in his book and just reference that and and we 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 just need to look into the legalities of it but um in principle everyone's been quoting people in journals white papers studies for years so why can't we sort of effectively quote them as a as an audio clip in a in a lesson so these guys are, are clearly doing that um and pulling it from multiple free sources so that's really encouraging because i i think i'd quite like to do that rather than um have the voiceover artist or or the the host read out a quote it's actually the, the get the original soundbite is, is way more impactful so yeah, that's a great point. There's a really good comment by Carl actually in the oh. discussion. I don't know whether that's yeah, yeah. Um, Carl, yeah. I think Carl's happy to come on and explain it because um he's here, he's there he is. Cool. Morning, Carl. Oh, we can't hear you at the moment. There that's you go. All right, just I'm, I'm muting. <laughs> yeah, no, I am just kind of making the point that um, um I'm kind of a massive fan of of podcasts and the kind of from a learning science point of view. You know, there's, there's, there's a huge amount to take in terms of upside. I, I really like, you know, that what it offers in terms of the, the low impact it has on your cognitive load. You know, when you're looking at screen-based learning, the senses are kind of overrun. If often there's too much content on the screen, animations going off. There's, there's so much your senses are, and your cognitive load is, is, is being attacked. And, um, that single auditory channel is 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 fantastic, refreshing, and um, especially if you spend a lot of time on the screen during the day. And what does that mean? Well, it allows you to um, imagine. It allows you to kind of also embed what you've been uh, learning as well, and um, it uh, it allows you to do other things. You mentioned note taking before. Massively important. Hope people are taking notes right now. Um, it allows you to do that really important task of note taking, and um, which we know um, can improve um, learning retention by about 20 to 30 30 percent. Um, and it allows for elaboration, which is really, really important. So that's elaboration is connecting one concept to another. So you know something about something, you hear something else that you can then connect to that other thing, and that helps uh, strengthen your memory. So some good things there, and, and also headphones as well. Um, I think, um, Nelson, you mentioned uh, your intimate session with Obama. Um, headphones, fantastic for focus, fantastic for attention. So if you're using them for podcast, it's, it's really, really good because we know focus and attention is so, so important when it comes to uh, when it comes to learning. So yeah, huge amounts of upside. So I just thought I'd uh, share some of that from a learning science perspective. Awesome. Yeah. Really good stuff, Carl. Thank you. I think it, uh, it, it hearing that just supports the kind of deeper learning, reflective um, experience that, that we've been thinking about, but the imaginative, creative thinking, lo love all of that. So um, if you have any studies or any research around it, we're, we're kind of craving it because there's, there's a lot of interest <laughs> out there to prove or in effect that this modality can support learning and it's as we established earlier it's largely been neglected so yeah exactly yeah yeah well yeah um, i'm happy to pick up on that um after this and see what i've got to 
I can share with you. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Carl. If you send them over, we can put them in the show notes for everyone to, to take a look over. And um, I guess before we get to another audience question, Nelson, any thoughts on sort of what Carl was sharing there? Yeah, I, I think it's incredible when you've got the, the kind of science and Carl um, we're going to have on the show soon um, to, to kind of pick his brain about um, all of the incredible people he's spoken to about learning science. But yeah, I think it's just another um, layer of, of kind of support for the format, um, which has, again, like Richard said, has been overlooked. And so it really is underpinned by strong learning science. And it's also got many other positives from production distribution perspective too. So, you know, really it's a format we need to start testing in the organization as, as soon as possible. It's a slight plug for how now, but, um, <laughs> Always it's, key, it's key that if if audio content is to go into your LMS, it's key that you have a good mobile application to it. It's so where we come across that not being possible. This is a bit tactical, but we are able to provide clients with a um, private podcast link. It's an RSS feed. So um, there's a tool called Transistor we use. There's a few others out there, but really uh, in the L and D space, you want everything in your LMS, all of your data. And so um, the mobile app is is kind of vital. And, and these guys definitely have that. We've tested it. It's, it plays great. You want it, a simple test is that you can hit play, close down your phone, and put it in your pocket and still be listening. It's as basic as that. And that's kind of table stakes in mobile learning. But um, you'd be surprised there's LMSs out there where it's not possible. So yeah, definitely test that one. Music to our ears, Richard music which we've been listening to on the how now app now that we know that it's got uh, <laughs> robustly tested uh just a final question for both of you has come from nick and the chat and it's about the typical structure of an educational podcast or a piece of audio content is there sort of best practices we should follow things we need to make sure we include and um, we've got the expert for this go for it richard <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> um so I think you you decide up front whether it's single voice or multiple voices. So those, those and then whether it's scripted or free flowing. So so those are kind of vital. Um, if it's um, more free flowing, then it's it's probably what's the well in both cases really it's what's the journey that you want to take the listener on and and how how much reflection time do you want to give them how overwhelming do you want to make the content not overwhelming but sort of heavy so you you've got all those factors to consider um in advertising world they often talk about story mountain and so the the journey you take somebody on you hit the peak of that story and then how you you fall off there and and leave with a a, a good a good energy so so it can be as as simple as you you say what you're going to say you you say it and then you say what you said you know the those elements um and really we in 10 minutes we've we've found that three um key quotes is probably enough um for people uh, we we tested it and there's there's kind of retention drop off if you um if you give too much and then you've got to have a bit of storytelling in there for sure um as well as factual so Hopefully that that helps. But we we've got a whole um brief. I'm I'm resisting saying this word, but it's um I always it's like a tongue twister word, pedagogy. And it, oh, it's yeah. so pedagogy. it's such a battle for me to get that one out. But uh, there you go. I think I nailed it. So um yeah. uh, that's vital. Yeah. And I guess another thing maybe that'd be useful is and, and I know you do this at some we use kind of those knowledge checks or things to make sure people are um understanding and applying so i guess that's probably something to like how can people can include that in um in their content as well yeah so in in your um so it depends where you serve the content but if it's in your lms you can have supplementary files if it's in in a kind of podcast provider say spotify apple etc then then you can actually put files in there in the speaker notes below um and we we've added infographics um in their transcripts reading lists knowledge check questions so so you get more of a a learning pack each time so there is the option to have um visuals um and we found that especially at a um the entry level actually of of learners the the one page infographic which holds five key points has been a really popular um uh, PDF to just print out 
for people so in that in that kind of onboarding early career stage training that's that's proven very popular so yeah supplementary materials is is a great one yeah you've got the just to build it in just just the idea of knowledge checks makes me think we're not that long away from alexa asking us questions and us having to answer back as a knowledge check so i don't think we're far from that yeah that's a great point there was a <laughs> um adam my co-founder had with dan clark and it, it was around and part of it was ar- around that actually and and making the knowledge check element interactive in so so when you used to call a bank and you give your your birthday or you say yeah. your name all, all of this um, voice recognition software it's it's there so it's it is actually possible to do it already it's just who's going to get there <laughs> yeah. no really interesting richard and uh, i guess we're coming right to the end now so it'd be cool to just maybe i know we didn't do it at the start but just a quick summary for people about who assemble you are what you do um in your own words i guess rather than me paraphrasing it but and also where people can find you if they want to connect yeah so um we're an audio learning business um we position our content as podcast style so we've produced an off the shelf library we also do bespoke um we're a small team we we launched this year um we've all got a healthy background in the lnd space and um in terms of finding me so um linkedin's probably the the number one place so um linkedin.com forward slash richard p ward um or um come to our site support at assembleu.com that basically comes through to me anyway and um yes we're, we're a partner with how now which um we're thrilled about to be part of how now plus as well which is great awesome that was a uh, really really interesting richard thanks for joining us and thanks to everyone for asking so many great questions if you want to know about future episodes of LD Disrupt Live, happens every other week on a Wednesday. Uh, we've got the rest of the year planned out. So if you just go to lu.ma forward slash how now, then uh, you'll find all of our schedule for the rest of the year. And hopefully we'll see more of you there.